HBO has the mother of dragons, but we've got the father of cyborgs. And ours is a real-life neuroscientist. Up next on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley, and today we have father of cyborgs, Dr. Philip Kennedy, neuroscientist, neurologist, and founder of Neural Signals, Inc. Dr. Kennedy was able to join us today through the generous support of Soylent. Thank you for being here, Phil. Very welcome. You know, before we start, can you just define what a cyborg is? A cyberkinetic organism, so a human that actually is computerized. Now, I know people say I'm a cyborg. Well, I certainly am not. You're not, <laughs> but, but I still want to call you father of cyborgs, if okay. I may. Okay, sure, if you want. Fictional cyborgs go all the way back to the 1940s with DC Comics' Robot Man. Star Trek had the Borg, and then we fast forward to Cyborg City, and next year's big reveal of the Justice League's Cyborg reboot. He's a cyborg. You should probably move. I heard about you. Didn't think you were real. I'm real and it's useful. Phil, the internet calls you father of cyborgs. Okay. Because in, in 1990, you made the first human cyborg. What were your goals? In that first surgery, all we wanted to prove is that it was safe. We didn't have to prove it was effective. And then in the second patient, JR, we um, wanted to do more than that, and we wanted to have them control the computer. So we're basically implanting patients at that point to control the computer, spell out words on the computer, you know, turn on the TV or whatever. You used gold and glass as the materials right. with the implant. Why did you use those materials? The, well, first of all, they're inert. They're acceptable by the body. Um, and the gold is acceptable also and is covered with Teflon as an insulation that's also acceptable. So I knew it wouldn't be rejected. And then we put trophy factors in the little tip of the electrode. You put tro trophy factors? Trophy factors. <clears throat> to get the neurons to send processes, neurites, to grow in and through the hollow tip. And that way it held it in the brain. And there were a couple of wires, I mean, we've done as many as six wires inside and the axons go all the way through, the wires are parallel to that, so we don't lose the signals. And in fact, the last patient has been 11 years still having signals. So it's like a plant growing roots in, in the yes. brain. <clears throat> and what part of the brain did you put it in? Initially, we put it just in the arm area. And There's when you say arm area, you mean arm area of the brain? Oh, the brain, oh yeah. Right, Not you didn't put no, it no, here. No, no, no. Yeah. no, arm area of the brain. So <clears throat> we put it in the arm area of the brain, which would normally control movements of his arm. And in fact, he had flipped that over to be cursor cortex. So the brain had adjusted. Now he didn't have to think about moving his arm. He was thinking about moving the cursor, and the cursor moved. So we, we had it that some signals drove it across, and some drove it down. So he could differentially fire them. And he could drive it across just to the letter he wanted. And he could control it so well that sometimes he would very little activity, and then just a blip, and it would move. So, yeah, so he could definitely control it. That was very happy. And one time, just to tell you another little story, um, <clears throat> we asked him to spell his name. So he spelled his name fairly well. He made a mistake. And Try and, it again. And is he doing this by controlling his arm? No, 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 he's not. He's thinking of controlling the cursor moving across the screen. Okay. So his arm is inert. Oh, yeah, he's totally paralyzed. Okay. Yeah. And so he's not moving his arm. So he's moving the cursor. So he spelled out his name. And then he spelt it again, and then again, and then, and then he was still making mistakes, so I said, do it again. And he started to spell out my name, and then somebody else's name. He got bored of spelling out his own name, <laughs> so he spelled out our name. Then we said, oh my goodness, yeah, this guy can control this thing. And uh, yeah, and so he was driving it across, and we get to the end of the screen, it would flip back to the beginning, and he'd drive it across or down. So. Is it fair to call the, the people on whom you've done surgery cyborgs? In a, in theoretically, yeah. How many cyborgs have you six. fathered? Six. <laughs> six? Yeah. Yeah, I'm the sixth. 
All right, what I'm about to tell you next is not the plot of DC's next movie. In 2014, like a classic movie scientist, our guest, Dr. Philip Kennedy, went down to Belize and instructed another brain surgeon to implant the cyborg device in his own healthy brain. Did you get superhuman powers? No, not at all. <laughs> I, I, I read that immediately following the surgery, you, you had trouble speaking. Yes. Did you panic? No, I didn't panic. See, I've done the surgery in rats and monkeys, and I've attended all the humans, including my own, though I was asleep. And I did not panic. Uh, but I was a bit anxious. But I anticipated that might happen. And in fact, they did a CAT scan and said, oh, you got a bit of swelling. Oh, that's fine. That'll go down. They gave me treatment. I laid there, went down. It got better. So in five days, I was speaking again and writing again gradually. So I gradually got it back over a few weeks. Did you, did you prepare your will before you went down there? Did I've you? had a will for a while, thank you. <laughs> did, you, did you think you could possibly die from the surgery? I thought it was a very remote possibility of dying from a surgery like that. But I did think that, yes, <clears throat> all things can go wrong. You can get a bleed, you can get um, infection, and you can get seizures and whatever. What was the goal of this surgery? The whole point of doing it was that <clears throat> in the previous patient, um, ER, Eric, on the internet, everybody knows Eric Ramsey, so he doesn't mind my name, his name being mentioned. He was totally paralyzed and he can't speak. So we recorded from him, and we've got good evidence that he was able to control the cursor and activate phonemes and speak out the phonemes. But the problem was that we didn't have a subject who could speak. So I needed somebody who could speak and then would speak in their head like Eric had to do and compare the signals. The signals that your brain makes when yes. you're thinking, yes. speaking. Yes. Is thinking and speaking something in your head the same thing? Right. Okay. Right. So in other words, if we could analyze oh. the signals while I was speaking, we could apply those analytical codings to somebody who was not able to speak, right. speaking in their head. And to see if they're the same. Mm -hmm. So, so the goal was not to turn yourself into a cyborg. It was, it was to determine that, that which neurons facilitate human speech. Mm -hmm. So yes. you, you risked your life for this. Why was this data? I didn't really risk my life. I mean, everybody says that, but no. I mean, I knew I wasn't going to die. I knew I could get hurt, and I'd taken precautions against that. Um, so there was, there was a risk. To yeah, any there surgery, a there's a risk. Yeah. Why was this data so significant? It's so significant because we can now use the data as a backdrop to people who can't speak. Would I like to do it again as somebody who can speak and not speak? Yeah, I would, because I didn't have it in my brain long enough to really stretch it out and do other tests. So it's gone. More tests. You yeah, didn't leave gone. it in. No, no. Um, so th it's a backdrop for that. As like I said, I'd like to have others. But um, like, for example, you've taken an ALS patient who's getting gradually getting worse and worse and is ALS, his speech, yeah. the Lou Gehrig's disease, that they become totally paralyzed, that lose their speech, et cetera. Um, then if you implant somebody like that early on when they're speaking, figure out what the signals are, uh, are, are can show us what, what we can actually, what speech we can produce, then as he loses it, the signals should still be there. And we know they're there because functional MRIs have been done to prove that in paralyzed people. And, in, um, and I've done it in, uh, in Eric. We did functional MRIs on all our patients. Of course, there are tons of movies about scientists experimenting on themselves. The Fly, Flatliners, some versions of Frankenstein, and, and that's only movies that start with the letter F. But there are also Nobel Prize winners who experimented on themselves. Barry Marshall drank a beaker filled with bacteria in order to prove it caused stomach ulcers. Ralph Steinman made breakthroughs in pancreatic cancer by treating his own illness. So, Phil, there was a precedence, but still the medical community was shocked by your decision. Is that right? No, I don't think so. I did present to the neurosurgeons, and they were um, interested, but not totally shocked. They were just, they were admiring in one way, but they were a little bit, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, did anybody said, say you're crazy? <clears throat> did anybody say, Phil, that's crazy? No, 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 they didn't. But I talked there, I, I pre presented the data, I briefly told you, and I also talked at an ethics panel. And my main message was, look, if I'm not going to harm anybody else and I'm not going to unduly harm me, you know, it's my brain. I can do what I want with it. It's none of your business in a way of saying it. I wouldn't say it like that. I might be rude to them. But basically, that's what it is. And um, 
there's no reason why we shouldn't experiment on ourselves if we think there's a need to do that. Um, at least I don't see any reason. I'm, I, if I'm hurting anybody, it's myself, not them. Someone once said that you had an Indiana Jones approach to science, that you were mucking around with the rules of research and, mm. and gambling with your own mind. Do you feel like Indiana Jones? No, I don't feel like Indiana Jones. But there's, there's a certain amount of truth to what they say. You see, a lot of people develop this great hypothesis and try to prove it. And they're fixing this hypothesis and they try to prove it. That's not the way I do science. I get data and I look at the data and see what the data tells me. And in fact, the data from my head and from Eric's head has given me something very, very interesting, which is that you can record externally and pick up what we call beta peaks, which are 12 to 20 hertz increases in amplitude, when people are saying a word at the beginning of the word, at the end of the word, and during inflection points. So what the data tells me is that, wow, we could possibly record externally without having to implant and produce some speech. It wouldn't be very much. I mean, it wouldn't be, but it could be near conversational rate and maybe several words. And that's why I had no hypothesis, no, it's just something that fell out of the data. And we followed it and tracked it now in me and other people. And it could provide a very simple way of providing a rudimentary speech prosthesis. So there's no hypothesis. Does that seem more pure science to you? To well, it is. It's more Indiana Jones. You just go search. Hmm. You know, so in that sense, they're right. But I, I don't send up these grant proposals with these big hypotheses that are earth-shattering. No, no, I just say what I want to do. Your organization's goals for, for brain-computer interfacing are, in order, uh, restore speech, restore mm -hmm. movement, mm -hmm. and enhance the healthy. Enhancing the healthy, that, that's really, that's a big deal. Do you, do you see these implants as something that people with healthy brains, humans, will somehow want mm -hmm. someday? Well, yeah, I do, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'm not sure I mentioned it before, but um, when we use our cell phone, if you ask a student a question, right, they'll usually say, just a moment, use their cell phone, go to WebMD or Google and find you the answer. So the cell phone has enhanced their memory banks. Yeah. Okay, so it already has. So um, it may not necessarily have enhanced their wisdom and mm. their intuition, but at least it gives them more knowledge like a spout out the answer that I was looking for. Okay. So I never thought about that. We are so attached to our cell phones that we're, yeah. we've almost made ourselves cyborgs. Yeah. I mean, if you, in the plane today when I was flying up, I mean, everybody, mm, cell phone, cell phone, cell phone. It was playing with the cell phone. Texting, and it's probably most of it's useless information, but it was something to do, you know. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I can see once we get more electrodes in there, more recording, um, could we enhance memory directly into the brain? Like we have the cloud now, which we didn't have 10 years ago, and you could access that directly and haul information down from the cloud. So you don't have to put any memory banks in your brain. You just have a cell phone in your brain that connects to the cloud. Right? So, I mean, you've already said that your stance on this when it comes to ethics is if it's my brain and I'm not hurting anybody, yeah. I should be able to do this. Do you see a future where there'll be some big cultural debate about should, oh, yeah. should everyone who can afford it do this, but then there'll be people who can't afford it and their okay. brains aren't as... All right, this is a huge question I'm glad you asked me. Um, people who can afford or not afford it. Well, people couldn't afford cell phones when they came out. They're big clunky things you carried around in a bag, right? Now everybody's got a cell phone. So the cost comes down and the ability to pay for it and the, the, the need that they have. But on the other side, if you enhance people so that they're super powerful, then different parties will want this, different governments will want this, and that's wrong. That's totally unethical. It should be for everybody, and hopefully the cost will come down. I mean, you take an example of the cost. The surgery cost in this country is about 100 grand, and Belize was like 20, 28,000. You know, so the cost of that comes down. But you need the devices are simple. With with your, if I follow your thoughts there, you'd need the same technology for everybody. Because what if one company does this better than another company? And yeah, different companies uh, compete with each other to bring the cost down and enhance the device. Yeah. If it did, oh That's my fine. gosh, I'm thinking of my iPhone. How many times will I have to open up my brain to get the upgrade? <laughs> no, it would download it automatically. All right. You know how they annoy <laughs> us with all these ads, the same thing. 
Some people these <laughs> days are getting magnetic finger implants that allow them to augment their sense. With these implants, your hand gets near an electromagnetic field and you can sense the vibrations. Phil, your work was with the outputs, but mm. as a neuroscientist, do you think, you know, given a healthy brain, a totally new set of inputs will eventually decode a pattern and make sense of it? Yes, definitely. People are working on that. So in other words, if, you're, <coughs> if you have a quadriplegia in your neck, broken neck, you d not only just can't move, you can't feel. Mm. But with ALS, you can feel. All right, so, so there's a big difference. So when you, can, when you have no sensation like that, you're going to get bed sores and things, but it just feels, what is this body here? Okay, so people are working on stimulating the sensory cortex. So there's a, a motor in a sensory cortex, motors in front of the sensory, and they put electrodes in there and have, sen have stimuli and gloves, etc., that will then stimulate uh, the sensory cortex. And that will provide the feedback you need for some of these devices to be really useful. So you need that loop. You need the sensory feedback. It's absolutely essential. In speech, it's okay. If you can hear, that's sensory feedback. In real life, science is working towards creating a prosthesis that the injured can control with their thoughts, just as we do with our biological limbs. Mm -hmm. Phil, to work with a brain-controlled prosthesis, prosthesis, we, we first have to understand the electrical impulses, right, that come from the brain. Yeah. So what are the hurdles to understanding those, those impulses? Well, as regards controlling devices, speech processes, and movement, etc., we need to have um, more units than I'd originally envisaged. Units of? More, uh, by unit I mean uh, individual neurons uh, pick up a lot of the firing because the neurons fire, the way to generate movement is to work as a group, as an ensemble. And so some, some, parts, uh, some parts of it will be active, some not active. So it's a whole, like if you imagine a crowd of people, you know, and some of them saying yes and some of them saying no, uh, it's something like that. Um, so, that, so getting that technology together, people are working on that. They're definitely working on it and getting implanted devices that will carry more than just the one or two signals that we had. But on the other hand, the way I thought about it originally is that if you get a few units that you can train that are conditioned to fire for certain patterns, you could use a few of those. And in our case, in my case, I had 65 single units, which is a decent number. But I had hoped to have much more than that. I hoped to have hundreds, but it didn't work out. So, um, so but you do, need, you do need large numbers of units, and that's a big technical problem. Um, the understanding of it is, is proceeding well, and decoding it, of course, is important, but we have the new field, well, not the new field, but a developing field of artificial neural networks that will help us to understand some of the decoding, and we actually use some of those um, in our work. So, so if and when scientists can unlock and record these impulses as instructions, either to form speech or to move a limb, and if we made that brain-controlled prosthesis a, a superhuman, bionic, shiny, beeping, mechanical wonder, are we entering yeah. into what we have hitherto fore thought of as sci-fi? Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of the, you know, like Blade Runner was the original one, a lot of those are coming true now. And that's why I kind of like those kind of movies, um, because they kind of predict what's going to happen. Do you have so, any fear of a future? Field? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, my fear is that it'll be abused and that certain governments or certain individuals will try to take it over and uh, could create havoc. So the simple answer is to have it for everybody and make it as, as inexpensive as possible. Of course, people with money will get it first, but there's no reason why we can't enhance everybody. I mean, everybody's got a cell phone. Do you Almost think everybody has a cell phone. Do you think it, it, everybody should be enhanced? I mean, no, I, I keep no. thinking of like, you know, to like Tour de France bikers doping. Like, no, I don't know. No, can, no, no. It's, it's it, it seems like cheating. Except for it's, obviously the patients you're working on. But a healthy yeah. person, healthy body, healthy mind seems, seems like steroids. Well, we go, this is a college, right? Why do people come here? Are they cheating because they're trying to enhance their no. knowledge compared to other people? Because they're curious. They're curious? They want to do better with themselves. Yeah. They're striving to get ahead and, you know, be, I suppose, uh, contributing citizens, pay their taxes. <laughs> you know, so 
is that cheating? No, it's not. It's just you want to get ahead. It's human nature. And anyway, it's inevitable, whether you don't like it or not, if, whether you like it or not, the it's going to happen. We're, we, cyborgs are coming. Yeah. And they are us. Yeah. They're going to happen. <laughs> so. do, once we all become cyborgs, <laughs> do the implants stay in our brains our whole lives? You get one implant? Yes. <clears throat> That's very important. I designed the electrode to be permanent, that it should last 50 years or more. Okay, because the tissue grows through, it holds it in place, you don't lose the signals for a decade. When do you put it in? Do you put it in your kids because you want them to go to a better college? I mean... Would I put it in my... <laughs> if they wanted it, sure. I don't see why not. Wow, this is going to be a minefield of really contentious ethical questions, right? Right, but the big ethical question is, again, if people try to corner the market, try to take it over, that's the issue. And it, as regards who's going to get it, well, anybody who can afford it initially, and then over time as it gets less expensive and more useful, you know, I mean, people use all sorts of things to study and get ahead. They use very safe, I shouldn't say maybe safe drugs, but like um, modafinil, which is a wakefulness medication. Yeah, but that helps not, people every, stay not a lot of people. You know what I did? I, I studied. I worked hard and studied. Right. To bed on time. That's how I got ahead. <laughs> Good for you. Right. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, so they kind of cheat a little bit. Yeah. All right. So, so humans are racing to improve their bodies, and machines are racing to improve their intelligence. Do you think that this cyborg movement is, is a way to stave off fears of artificial intelligence surpassing humans, you know? Well, according to Ray Kurzweil, his first book said it happened in um, 20... Ah, the singularity is near, the singularity, right? singularity, yeah. yeah. That's when the singularity would occur. Then he revised that and said it'll be 2029. Will you explain what the singularity is? It, yeah, it just means that artificial intelligence, robots maybe, but computers certainly, that have artificial intelligence will be considered human. And as he said, which I thought was quite a mouthful, he said they will be given the same rights as humans have. Wow, really? That's what he said. And he said it'll start to happen 2029, and that's pretty soon, you know, mm -hmm. so 12 years away. And then it'll increase as, as they get better and better. And um, I think if we enhance ourselves, we will keep pace. But I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, I can't predict if the computers aren't eventually going to outpace us, and I think they probably will. Does that but scare you? No, I think it's the evolution. I mean, think about, like, when we started out, as you know, we weren't Nathanthals, but we were Homo sapiens. I don't know if we're still wise or not, but we started gradually developed, and we're still evolving. And evolving intellectually, um, and I think that's part of the evolution of the human race. You think part of the human evolution is to create something artificial that is smarter than we are? I know about the word artificial, but certainly smarter than us. Yeah. I mean, just if you create something, I guess it's artificial, but it certainly would be smarter than us and have more capabilities. Um, yeah, I think that's what's going to happen. I think that's our future evolution. As, as father of cyborgs, what would be your perfect cyborg movie? If you, could, if you could create a story, put it on the big screen, what would it be? Am I allowed to say this? You can edit yes. that if you want. <laughs> I wrote a book called 2051, which predicts and everything I said in it is possible, okay? And it's a prediction of what's going to happen, especially for space travel. So in other words, we would get rid of our bodies, use our brains inside an artificial body, and go off into space. So, here you go. Is this a non-fiction book in which you're predicting the, science is it, the future, what I call or is it a, it a fiction? No, I, well, I don't believe it's fiction. I believe it's science prediction. I'm mm. predicting 2051 what's going to happen. So our brains, would, would they be cyborg brains? Would, would yeah, they'll be totally implanted and connected to the artificial body and connected to each other, et cetera, et cetera. This is really soon you're predicting this. Well, it's only soon because we're getting older. <laughs> That's true. But can you maybe shed light on why what you're saying scares me? You seem sanguine about this kind of future, I, uh, are you? Yeah. Why? Or why shouldn't I be afraid of this kind of future? To me, it just deconstructs all the, the, all the things that, that seem to make us and keep us human. Well, it's how you define human. You know, it's how you define it. 
And uh, you have your f fixed idea, I presume, about what a human being is. Um, and I guess I don't, you know, because what we are today, you know, sitting on these TV cameras and just going out to everybody, could they do that 100 years ago? No. Could, could they even have a radio 200 years ago? No. So we're evolving. So, you know, you got to sit back and accept it. Chill out. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's the message from the father of cyborgs. Everybody, <laughs> okay. chill out. That's it. <laughs> Phil, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. That's all we have time for today. Whatever we can't fit into this half hour, we'll share on our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page. And if you want to watch past episodes, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab. Or download our app to keep up with everything related to Science Goes to the Movies all in one place.